Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's panel, Healthcare and Abortion in a Post-Roe America. It's clear that the end of Roe v. Wade has important implications uh, for abortion in the United States. What is less clear is what will happen to access to reproductive health care more generally. With many patients fearful of losing that access, provide for providers fearful, fearful of violating the new rules governing that access, and important questions about how this will deepen health inequities in the United States. We have a great panel with us today to discuss what the Supreme Court Dobbs decision means for uh, access to abortion, um, as well as access to reproductive health care and equity in the United States. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, we are joined by Aletha Ackers, who is Vice President for Research at the Guttmacher Institute, where she leads a research team that provides vital data and information to policymakers and the public about the demographics, needs, and availability of reproductive health care, while also developing the evidence base to inform its future. Prior to that, Dr. Ackers was an OBGYN and adolescent physician here at Penn and at CHOP. We're also joined by Reagan McDonald Mosley, who is CEO of Power to Decide, an organization that works to improve reproductive well being for all by providing trusted information, expanding access to quality services, and catalyzing culture change. Previously, she was the Chief Medical Officer at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Dr. McDonald Mosley is also an OBGYN and family planning physician. Heather Schumacher is the Director of the State Abortion Access at the National Women's Law Center. She works to advance state laws and policies that protect reproductive rights and promote access to comprehensive health care. Prior to joining the center, Heather was the State Policy Director at the National Abortion Federation and Senior Public Affairs Director for Planned Parenthood Keystone. And moderating today's event will be LDI Senior Fellow Courtney Shriver, who is the Stuart and Emily Mudd Professor of Human Behavior and Reproduction in the Department of OBGYN and the Chief of the Division of Family Planning here at Penn School of Medicine. She is the founding director of the Pregnancy Access, I'm sorry, the Pregnancy Early Access Center at Penn Medicine, which is a national model for integrated family planning and early pregnancy care. So thank you all for joining you. Corey, I will turn it over to you and I look forward to your conversation. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Rachel and LDI so much for bringing us together today in this fantastic panel. Um, this is gonna be a great opportunity for us all to benefit from your diverse expertise professionally and how to really find our footing, I think, in this quickly shifting landscape. Of course, at its core, abortion is health care and access to abortion and its related health care arguably has unparalleled ripple effects on sex disparities in our country and globally, on equality and honestly on our social fabric. So I thought, Reagan, and I'm going to use your first name since we've known each other a long time, if it's okay, I'll do that for everybody. Um, I thought maybe we could start with you, honestly, for level setting for this large audience we have with us today. In addition to limiting access to abortion, the Dobbs decision could have a major impact on access broadly to reproductive health care. Can you tell us what you anticipate or what you're seeing now is the fallout of Dobbs and what access to reproductive health care is looking like now and who's most impacted? Thank you so much, Corey, and to the LDI team for the invitation to join you here today and speak about this important topic. I think in, in response to your question, it's important to remember, right, that abortion is a common part of the reproductive life course for people capable of reproduction. In fact, it's estimated that one in four women will have an abortion in their lifetime, right? And the places where people seek abortion care are also places that provide other critical services, like the center that you've created at the University of Pennsylvania, where you not only provide abortion care, but also treatment for early pregnancy failures and other issues in early pregnancy. So the places where people seek abortion are also providing miscarriage management. They're providing testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections, cancer screenings, preconception care, referral for prenatal care, among other things, right? In states where abortion is banned or highly restricted, clinics are closing and seeing far fewer patients, impacting opportunities for all of these types of services. At Power to Decide, we're actively tracking the number of health centers continuing to stay open and delivering abortion care for our database and website, abortionfinder.org. And just since June, over 60 health centers have closed altogether 
or have paused services. These closures have reduced delivery of services has undoubtedly led to less access to reproductive health services writ large. And it's important to remember that these changes are happening in communities with some of the greatest barriers to contraception, with some of the highest rates of sexually transmitted infections, and the highest rates of maternal mortality in the, in the country. The overturning of Roe has had and will continue to have drastic and dramatic downstream impacts related to people's overall reproductive well-being. Lastly, I think it's important to remember that because of where these changes are happening and the demographics of who is more likely to seek these services, we know that all of these changes will disproportionately impact people of color, particularly Black women, and people with lower incomes, thus exacerbating health inequities that have plagued our nation for decades. Thank you. Um, you know, the Dobbs decision, Heather, has created this very chaotic legal environment for patients and for providers. In fact, there's already a question in the chat about this, that um, will there be any obstetricians in red states in a few years? So I wonder if um, these states that have had the trigger laws in place, states where um, there have been immediately enacted bans on abortions, what's happening at the state level to secure or deny reproductive health care for women and the impact on health care delivery broadly? Yeah, and thank you, Courtney, and, and thanks for having me today. I, I wish I could spend all day on this on this answer, but I'll, I'll do my best to, um, to to get the top lines in a few minutes. So um, I think probably a lot of folks on this um, webinar have heard that post-OBS, we expect to see more than half of states ban abortion. And right now I'm tracking um, 20 states in which abortion access has either been banned or made more inaccessible post-OBS, including um, near total bans, six week bans, um, other bans that would have been unconstitutional um, before the overturning of Roe. Um, and then a couple of states that, you know, clinics are not providing because there is such legal uncertainty um, and, and they've been effectively um, worried about providing that care. And most of the bans that are in place are those trigger bans that you named, the bans that were triggered by the overturning of the right to abortion, or pre-row bans that were still on the books. Um, two states, Indiana and West Virginia, have passed abortion bans post the Dobbs decisions. Indiana's ban is in effect, and West Virginia's is awaiting governor's signature. And, and I will add to the, the West Virginia ban, it has a... Um, um, a a related resolution that the House passed in West Virginia that was very explicit that these that these bans are related to, um, to what they think is a woman's role um, as a mother. Um, so there's there's really there's no they're now saying the quiet part out loud. Um, on the flip side, many states are taking action to protect the right to abortion and to expand access. Um, just to name a few, we've seen states repeal existing, uh, existing abortion restrictions, such as laws that say only a physician can provide care, like in Maryland or Connecticut. We're seeing states remove the funding barriers that exist what, from creating funds to help folks pay for their care, like in, in California, um, or using state and local funds to do the same, um, expanding insurance coverage, making sure there's, there's gap coverage um, in Massachusetts. We're seeing states um, create laws that protect providers, protect people who have abortions, um, and those who help them get help get them abortions. Whether from prohibiting medic medical malpractice insurance companies and medical licensing boards from taking adverse um, action against abortion providers, to refusing to participate in a hostile state's investigation of pregnancy outcomes, to decriminalizing self-managed abortion. Um, I, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we're also seeing states expand medication abortion availability. So, for example, in Massachusetts, um, recently passed a requirement for public colleges and universities to provide medication abortion. Um, and then the, the last one that I will highlight, because it is such a huge trend, um, we're seeing states ensure the right to abortion um, and, you know, like earlier this year, we saw that happen in state statute in, in Colorado. But something that's that's a huge trend this year and going forward um, are ballot measures. 
Most recently, um, I'm sure folks have heard that the, the Michigan Supreme Court ruled that a ballot measure enshrining abortion access in their state constitution will be on the ballot in November. Likewise, we'll see ballot measures in Vermont and Canada and, uh, excuse me, Canada, they already have access, in California um, in November that could add abortion protections to their constitutions. And then on the flip side, we saw the first um, fight on, on an anti-abortion ballot. In August, Kansans rejected a ballot measure that would have amended their state constitution to say that there's no constitutional right to abortion. Um, and then we will also see similar ballots um, in Kentucky and Montana in November. Um, so those those are some of the things that we are we are looking at right now. But certainly, um, there's there's only so much that states that have access can do to ensure access for those that that don't have access. So it's, it's certainly not a panacea. That's amazing listening to you sort of rattle all of that off, like the sense of fragmentation, it just can't be um, underscored enough. It's such a, that is part of this seismic shift, this idea that um, what patients can access, what providers can do is um, more than ever now is so variable by where, by where we live. And so sort of when we think about this on a policy level, uh, Aletha, Given the Guttmacher's Institute role, Institute's role as a source of evidence-based information for reproductive health and for healthcare policy, what is your organization thinking of as the most important research in this moment? That's a great question. I think particularly given the context that uh, both Reagan and Heather have set. Um, you know, the reality is that the the Dobbs decision really overturned what was a linchpin in the SRHR space, the sexual and reproductive health and rights space. And has really created, Corey, as you just said, really this shifting dynamic environment, uh, where as Heather just described, there's so much that's taking place, it's almost difficult to kind of wrap your head around it and get a good sense of where things are and what the priority should be. Abortion bans have gone uh, into effect rapidly in a number of different states, and there are concerns about the impact of those bans uh, and additional restrictions that may be proposed. And as we've heard uh, this week, potentially new restrictions proposed at the federal level, um, and particularly what those impacts might be on specific vulnerable communities. And then, as Heather just noted, there are certainly um, some states that are rapidly moving uh, to put protections in place, not just for their populations, but also uh, for women and other people with the capacity for pregnancy to come into those states to receive services. And so there's really a lot that's happening. And the Guttmacher Institute really recognizes the critical, uh, not only role that we can play, but our responsibility in really responding to this moment and, and preparing for the aftermath. I'll start with saying, you know, what are there are a variety of ways in which we have traditionally played this role in doing policy tracking and examining the impact on specific populations. Uh, in conducting both national level and state level surveillance st statistics to monitor trends in uh, the need for different services, access to services and what those gaps are, and really highlighting those um, for advocates, for researchers and policymakers. Uh, and then really uh, at a communications level, making sure that we're getting that information out to the individuals who can really best use that. And those three areas really represent our theory of change. How do we go about gathering information and really making sure that that information, that evidence can be used for tremendous impact. In terms of what we're seeing right now, there's there's really a lot of need um, from continuing to monitor those state policies uh, and figuring out where we can produce policy relevant evidence that can be used um, in order to block bans or advance uh, legislation that's really gonna be positive in terms of not only protecting, but expanding access um, to abortion care, post-abortion care and broader sexual and reproductive health services. There's also a need for supporting state level allies and advocates with either information or with creating strategic alliances so that individuals can work together. Together, we can have a lot more impact than everyone working individually. There's also the need to really generate uh, additional research on oh. topics that are implicated um, by the Dobbs decision, um, such as access to publicly funded contraceptive services and maternal health care, 
Reagan mentioned um, the tremendous impact that this decision can potentially have on maternal morbidity and mortality, which is another critical area, um, particularly for our country where uh, we have not, we've got many resources, but haven't been doing tremendously well in that area. We need to make sure that we're providing key data and analysis to critical stakeholders where advancing policy um, change across a wide range of sexual and reproductive health areas, not just abortion. This is not a single issue entity. Abortion is a huge issue right now, but it is part of a broader landscape of sexual and reproductive uh, health uh, rights that people need. And all of that uh, is really happening within the broader context uh, of uh, individuals' need for comprehensive health care services. Abortion is regular routine health care. Um, with all of this, I think it's also really important to say we can't forget to your question, Corey, about, you know, what do we think is the most important thing? It's really to remember that not all populations are going to be equally affected by this decision, but there are some particular vulnerable populations um, that we know of, but there may be others who are disproportionately uh, affected who may be more hidden. And so at Guttmacher, we think what's critically important is both doing the routine work, but also being mindful um, to be aware of populations who may be adversely affected um, in new ways, in different ways, so that we can bring that to light and make sure that we are best meeting their needs. And then I think the last point that I would want to make is as we're doing all this, we need to be mindful about how we're messaging um, on this issue, that we are careful not to um, highlight the populations that may most need our support in a way that sets up an us versus them framework, because that can sometimes uh, backfire and wind up not generating the type of support that we know we need. We know that more than two thirds of individuals in this country actually support individuals' right to abortion uh, access. And so being really careful that the way in which we're messaging and providing this information doesn't inadvertently drive people away, but really highlights the fact that this is really a shared priority for Americans. Such an important point, Aletha. Thank you for bringing that forward. I mean, you know, when I listen to all of you, I think about state level legislation, national level legislation, um, big picture policy concerns that are being brought forth, but really behind all of that are individuals, right? Like people, our sisters, our neighbors, ourselves. Um, and so Reagan, I wonder if maybe you could speak a little bit to sort of a little more on how um, adolescents, for example, are being affected by that. And are there areas on an individual level, our patients, um, the people we care about, our communities that maybe are being less widely discussed related to these restrictions and the, kind of the fallout from them? And then after we sort of hear from you on that, Heather, I was thinking, because there's a related question in the chat about restrictions. How are these restrictions affecting individuals? How are the laws actually affecting individuals? And are these ind are these laws targeting patients, the people seeking care? Are these laws targeting providers, those who are giving care? And um, sort of who's vulnerable related to the laws? So I guess I'm, I'm wondering who's clinically vulnerable and then who's sort of criminally vulnerable. So maybe Regan, I'll, I'll ask you to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, thank you for for honing in on that. And I think to Aletha's point, right, like not all of us are going to be um, impacted the same, right? These laws and changes are going to impact certain people and certain individuals and communities more than others. And certainly adolescents are front and center with that. Regarding abortion access, you know, preg uh, pregnant adolescents are absolutely going to be uniquely impacted by these laws. While it's true that adolescents are less likely to experience a pregnancy in general compared to young adults or older adults, um, it is true that if they do experience a pregnancy, that pregnancy is much more likely to be an unintended pregnancy, and they're more likely to seek abortion care, right? While, uh, while about 50% of pregnancies overall are reported to be unintended, that number is higher to in about 60% for adolescents. Moreover, adolescents tend to identify their pregnancies later in pregnancy and to show up for care later in pregnancy. And so with some of these restrictions happening earlier in pregnancy at six weeks, it's much harder for people to navigate care. Moreover, think about being a young person, a minor, um, and living in a state where abortion is completely banned. Um, it's often impossible for adolescents to travel out of state alone. Um, they need parental involvement in most states 
Um, and now there's decreased help and resources for judicial bypass um, if they're not able to involve their parents. And while most adolescents do involve an adult, you know, family structures can be complicated. It might not be a parent. They might not have a parent that's available to them. Their parent may be incarcerated. Their parent um, may not be involved in their life. So that adult might be a grandparent, an older sibling, um, someone close to them. Most adolescents do involve someone close to them, but requiring parental involvement can be a huge burden um, and a huge barrier to accessing care, making care sort of out of the range of possibilities for adolescents. And then again, we overlay the need to travel out of state in some circumstances. So it's really um, something that we need to be uh, paying attention to. And I know our colleagues at Guttmacher and other places are monitoring this and collecting data. Um, but the situation on the ground in many of these states is that adolescents who are pregnant now and seeking abortion care are not able to get the care at all. I think the other population that we need to be thinking about are immigrant populations uh, who may not have documentation and may not be able to leave their state. Um, and you know that's another area where we need to be collecting data and doing research and focusing our efforts to ensure that they have the support that they need to get the care that they need. Thank you, Reagan. Heather, in terms of how these laws are structured and who's vulnerable legally or criminally related, is it is it mostly the people seeking the care or the people providing the care? And, and how does that actually play out in terms of vulnerability? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that in a, in a two-part way like that, because that's exactly how I think of um, the, the issues um, at hand. You know, the, the laws, you know, speaking broadly, are written to target the abortion providers. You know, most of the, the bans criminalize abortion providers, and it's a very convenient framing for the anti-abortion movement to be able to say, oh, we're, we're, we're only going after the, the abortionists, which is not an actual term. Um, and it makes them a very um, convenient scapegoat. And, you know, one, first and foremost, abortion providers, I will say, are, are um, just human rights champions and, and some of my favorite people. So that's certainly not all right. Um, but secondarily, um, the actual impact and effect of those laws is quite different than what the, the letter of the, the legislation says. Um, and I should add that, that some of the bills and laws like Texas SB8 are also written to additionally like um, specifically target those that aid and abet um, people who get abortions. So like an abortion fund or other help organizations. But, uh, you know, the reality is that we have long seen people punished for their pregnancy outcomes. And we know that under these types of laws and restrictions, that outcomes will be under greater scrutiny. And um, like my, my colleagues have named, you know, not all communities are, are similarly impacted. The same folks that have been scrutinized for their pregnancy outcomes, black and brown women in particular, will continue to be under greater scrutiny. Um, we expect that people will be punished for traveling out of state to get their abortion care, that people will be targeted for helping people seek abortion care, including, you know, employers and everyone related um, under this increased surveillance and invasion of privacy. And all of that is, is, is a result of um, the criminalization, criminalization of abortion providers and the criminalization of, of pregnancy outcomes um, in, in these laws. And Corey, if I may, I wanted to just jump in. Um, it was really struck by um, many of Reagan's um, comments about uh, vulnerable populations. And I wanted to add one to, the, to this conversation, particularly given um, some of the comments Heather just made um, about kind of who might be targeted as part of this. And what I wanted to add on is just the population of individuals who may have um, chronic medical problems, physical um, disabilities, or other types of conditions whereby their pregnancies may need to be um, uh, to be most successful, may need to be adequately planned, and or individuals for whom their underlying medical conditions might potentially make pregnancies unsafe um, in certain situations. And I think this one-size-fits-all uh, legislative uh, approach um, to abortion care 
doesn't adequately take their needs into account and can delay receiving timely medical care that can be of benefit um, to those individuals. And I think that that is something for individuals who have worked in the clinical sphere, um, we're very cognizant of, but I don't think it's something that the general public knows a lot about and, and just represents a really unique population whereby these policies may really miss the target in terms of trying to be um, supportive of family formation. I recently heard um, an expert speaking about um, that the access to abortion is really what allows many people who have chronic medical problems that can make pregnancy risky, the opportunity to try for a pregnancy. Because knowing that they can end the pregnancy if it's medically necessary, if their health gets too threatened during the pregnancy is what allows them to try to have the family that they want. Um, and there is a question in the Q&A about this issue of when to intervene and exceptions around people um, who may be sick during a pregnancy where ending the pregnancy is the safest thing for their health. And there certainly has been quite a bit in the media, but maybe not everybody sees those articles about how sick is too sick and how those decisions are being made. Heather, I don't know if you can speak to that at all, um, sort of what the, what, what law, what exceptions there may or may not be in laws for this and how legal counsel can support clinicians and patients in that really vital decision-making time. And then maybe Aletha, after that, we could ask you a little bit about sort of what, what are the policy implications of, of the fallout of that? Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to start that conversation. Um, you know, first and foremost, no abortion ban is reasonable, it, you know, regardless of what exceptions it includes. Um, and secondly, I, I think probably my medical <laughs> colleagues on the panel, I'm, an, I'm a lawyer, um, can probably speak to how they how they work in practice. But my understanding is that, you know, the folks writing these laws are our attorneys, our policy folks, you know, they are intended to, to have clarity. They are intended um, from the anti-abortion movement to create confusion and have a chilling effect on providers. And so, uh, you know, using the West Virginia law that's awaiting governor's signature as an example, I believe the, the exceptions in that are um, in, in situations of rape and, and incest, up to eight weeks after a last menstrual period. And so, you know, a lot of folks don't know they're pregnant at that point. So what sort of exception is that? Um, a lot of other exceptions will require um, in a situation of rape or incest that the person have reported it to uh, law enforcement, which we, we know that not folks don't always do that. Um, and, and in other exceptions, it's there's very little clarity about um, when a medical situation rises to a, a point at which the exception would um, go into effect, right? And it, it leaves it to the medical provider to be assessing their own risk in the moment when they should be able to be concentrating on their patient and their patients um, and the best care that they can be providing, um, not their own legal risk. Yeah, and Corey, you would ask kind of what might be the policy implications, and, and I think in many ways, Heather kind of answered that question with where she started, which is um, these decisions really need to be left to a patient and a provider. You can't legislate um, a clinical scenario and, and situation. Um, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, I trained as an obstetrician gynecologist. I've taken care of patients who have had complex cardiac conditions or lung conditions, whereby we know that that increases their risk of complications during pregnancy. You can provide the best medical care possible, but you can't necessarily anticipate or predict uh, or legislate that they are only going to have complications prior to six weeks or eight weeks or 15 or 20. This is not a space where we need legislators. This is a space where we need uh, trained physicians working with their patients to provide patients with the best information in medical care possible, and yet skilled and knowledgeable enough to be able to make the right decisions medically when the need arises without having to ask judges for permission to provide care. Um, and so I think this is really a place where physicians, 
and patients need to be able to make these decisions in a timely fashion. The policy implications of trying to do otherwise will result in both delays in care and to the point that uh, Reagan already um, pointed out, differential care for patients in different potential population groups or risk groups. Um, and I think the, the implications are really about increases in maternal morbidity and mortality. I will say that we have lots of evidence from the global space that putting abortion restrictions in place does absolutely nothing to improve the health and safety uh, of uh, women and individuals with the capacity for pregnancy. In fact, what it does is increases the proportion of unsafe procedures while not at all changing the number of actual abortions that happens. So these decisions need to be made between patients and their providers. Alitha, I'm so glad you brought that forward because there were questions in the chat about sort of what things looked like before Roe v. Wade, um, what data are available to us to help us anticipate what things could look like here based on um, before abortion access was constitutionally protected, um, what things looked like in the United States. So I think you spoke to that a little bit. Um, thank you. And um, so Reagan, there are also questions in the chat about um, access to emergency contraception, contraception more broadly. We've a little touched on the overlap between access to abortion and sexual and reproductive health care more broadly. I think some of the um, listeners today want to understand what's exactly touched by this um, these legislative efforts and maybe what could be touched by these legislative efforts. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think one thing to just from pulling a thread from the your prior comments, like one huge difference between the pre-Roe era is now the ubiquity of medication abortion, right? Like that's huge. Um, it's revolutionary technology and has been increasingly utilized in the United States since it was approved over 20 years ago. Um, over half of all abortions uh, are now done via medication abortion, and that percentage is even higher, right, for, for people who are pregnant in the, in the first trimester. It's safe, it's effective, um, and there are an increased number of resources for people to do that in, their, in the community, right, for people who are using telehealth provision models. And of course, now the FDA um, has finalized their uh, decision that that removes the in-person dispensing requirement that really has opened the door for for more telehealth provision of medication abortion, which is amazing and very different. Um, but that's not going to be a solution for everyone because there are a lot of state restrictions around um, medication abortion via telehealth, either because it's specifically banned, uh, which is the case in a number of states, or because the state requires an in-person visit, um, and over half of the states require at least one visit in person. Um, and of course, you could overlap the places where abortion is highly restricted or banned right now, uh, and where um, in-person visits are required, and there's a lot of overlap there. So um, while medication abortion is an amazing technology and increased access to abortion care, it's not going to do that, in particular in states that already have a lot of restrictions and regulations around abortion access. Um, Around just broader reproductive health services, there is a lot that can be done to improve access. Um, there's still, the Affordable Care Act has been amazing and has re reduced sort of the cost burden for a lot of people, um, not for everyone, but it has made, it's been a huge game changer around contraceptive access. But there are still a lot of systems barriers. Uh, I was able to visit with a team in Dallas, Texas, which apparently has one of the highest rates of, of repeat teen pregnancy rates in the country. Um, and they shared with me that to get an appointment for contraception for someone who's low income, it can take four months. And if that person wants uh, one of the more expensive or more effective methods like an IUD or an implant, it can take seven months. Like that is not access, right? So we need to be doing everything possible to decrease systems barriers to the full scope and scale of contraceptive methods. Um, we also, we talked a little bit about adolescent access to abortion before. It's important to remember that in some states, adolescents still have to have their permission for routine contraception care um, and for other services. So those are policy barriers that could be lifted that could also increase adolescents access to telehealth provision for contraception as well. 
Uh, the FDA will soon, uh, actually in November, we just learned, will be considering an application for an over-the-counter pill. That could be a huge game changer, particularly for rural communities, for young people who have unique barriers to getting into a health center and accessing care. So hopefully that will be approved without age restriction and will be a huge game changer um, for contraceptive access around the country. Thank you. Um, there's some questions about the chat about what is the Dobbs decision, and then a lot of questions related to how school nurses or other providers, what this means for counseling students, for enabling young people to be connected with the care they need. So I thought maybe it, this was a good opportunity just to review the scope of the Dobbs decision and allow people to understand sort of what their power is or is not really depending on their state. And, um, and just to think about sort of how, what our role might be both as um, in our own professional spheres and also potentially as advocates. Uh, Heather, maybe you could start with that. Thank you. Sure, I can start there. Um, so the, the Dobbs decision, um, it stems from a challenge to a Mississippi abortion uh, abortion ban, um, which should have been clearly unconstitutional under close to 50 years of legal precedent by the Supreme Court. Um, and it, it should have been a no-brainer <laughs> because, you know, that the, the Supreme Court is is bound to abide by their their legal precedent, um, and it was is, it was quite clear um, from from all the legal precedent. But instead, in in June, the Supreme Court um, basically affirmed the the abortion ban, let it stand, um, and said that in addition to that, we are going to overturn the underlying federal right to abortion. And so what that means um, <laughs> in, to some degree is that that decision as to whether abortion can be legal or not in some degree is left to the states to decide. And so that's why, um, you know, as I started, you're seeing a real patchwork even more so than already existed in the states um, really play out where states are now allowed to completely ban abortion. Um, with very limited um, exceptions, they can put on whatever restrictions they want, essentially. Um, but it does not mean that abortion is banned in the country, right? So you see other states, um, blue states, um, expanding access, really creating space to take the folks that are, are seeking the abortion care in states that have um, more hostile access to abortion. Um, if, and but what it what it will mean going forward is that we will likely see um, more than half of states ban abortion, um, and that the the legal chaos that um, is already playing out will continue for many years, um, decades even, um, and, and access to care will, will suffer in the in the meantime. And. Alitha, I may ask you to follow up on that sort of when we think about how the Guttmacher Institute has mapped how the United States, the restrictions or lack of restrictions for abortion laws in the United States over years, decades, honestly, that we, the Guttmacher has produced those maps. Um, and then we also see that some of the most concentrated abortion care has been in states that are now restricting care. Um, and those places often are also where um, black women have been needing to access abortion at highest rates and now may not have that access. And I wonder sort of what the implications of that are and how Guttmacher is thinking about that. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Corey. So, um, Guttmacher, as you indicated, um, has as part of what it's provided for many years done a number of things. Um, uh, you were referencing uh, the map of which we uh, put out earlier this year, a new interactive map uh, that really allows people to see kind of the chaos that Heather has been talking about in terms of how um, state policies uh, are changing uh, in a real time fashion. Um, and we've been mapping those um, types of policy changes at both the state and federal level um, for decades. Um, and so uh, those maps, and if you go to the Guttmacher uh, website, 
um, you can go to the uh, information page and you can see, you can click on interactive uh, maps and you can pull up uh, those maps as well as some other interactive uh, ways of seeing our data and producing um, tables from that. Um, but I think that those maps will allow people to kind of make sense of what's happening in real time. As Heather uh, indicated, what, uh, what we predicted and what we're seeing on the ground and what we think will continue uh, to happen is that uh, approximately 26 states are anticipated um, to enact abortion bans uh, in some uh, way, shape or form or another. Uh, and more than uh, half of those anticipated 26 states have either um, uh, had bans go into effect uh, or uh, have put um, uh, have uh, put those uh, out and they're currently under, under consideration. It's going to be challenging to kind of map um, what happens in terms of the fallout from this because we expect that things are going to be changing quite uh, quite rapidly. Patients are going to have to be trying to figure out kind of how to navigate um, getting care, where to get care, navigating transportation, paying to, to travel longer distances. Um, our uh, research uh, teams at Guttmacher over the course of the last year have put out a, a number uh, of uh, reports or blogs indicating the anticipated increase in travel distances uh, in states that have either proposed bans or enacted bans. And in the case of Texas's SB8 um, uh, policy that went into effect in August of 2021, we found uh, that patients from that single state um, were going to uh, more than 40 different states across the country to receive care uh, and that um, access to abortion uh, had plummeted to less than 1% of individuals uh, needing those services actually being able to achieve them. Um, and so the maps can be really helpful um, for that. Another piece of this that I want to bring up, uh, though, Corey, that you didn't quite ask about, um, but I think is really implied in a lot of what we've been talking about is I've talked a lot about kind of the data that Guttmacher has produced and what's the important data to continue collecting. But again, a learning lesson that we can bring in uh, from international environments where abortion has been restricted is that it's really hard to measure something that is illegal. And so one of the things that's gonna be really important for us moving forward is to both continue doing the measurement measurements that we have been doing so that we can uh, make comparisons, but thinking critically about the ways in which we might need to evolve our measurements in order to best meet this moment to be able um, to accurately capture um, the procedures that may be taking um, place, particularly unsafe uh, procedures uh, in this uh, evolving landscape. Um, we at Guttmacher have pioneered a number of different approaches, um, but we also recognize that oftentimes those approaches um, have significant biases and limitations. And one of the things that we're working on is continuing to evolve that. So for the researchers that are on this call, this is a, a ripe area uh, for exploration and collaboration um, without sound, accurate evidence and data. It's really hard for us to advocate um, for the change that needs to be happen happening, uh, as well as to lift up the potential um, uh, negative impacts of these decisions. Uh, Courtney, you also asked me about kind of um, the reality that many of these restrictions, abortion bans that are going in place are happening uh, uh, in states where Black women uh, are and, and Black individuals with the capacity for pregnancy are disproportionately affected. Um, and to that, I would say this is not accidental. Many of those states are also states where there is a longstanding traditional history, uh, policy history of redlining, uh, which really limits access uh, to housing, uh, of policies that really restrict access um, to education, primary and secondary education for children, economic limitations uh, on people's ability um, to get um, longstanding uh, jobs with pay security. Um, these are places where there are lots of policies in different sectors that really uh, limit individuals' um, ability uh, to really fully uh, exercise their personhood. And so these abortion uh, restrictions are uh, coming at a time and affecting populations that are among the most marginalized and where there are a plethora of policies uh, that have a negative impact on those individuals. This is, you asked why that's important. It's important because these individuals, policies like this make it much harder for these individuals to parent the children that they have. More than six out of 10 individuals who seek an abortion already have children in their households. 
it also makes it very hard for those families to provide the resources that their children need to survive and thrive. Um, and so it's for all these reasons that I think it is uh, really important that we think critically uh, about these bans, not in isolation, but in terms of how they work with other policies that are on our books that really um, disproportionately impact uh, black and brown populations, but also make it very hard for those families and those children to survive and thrive. I would love to make a couple of remarks, um, Courtney, if it's okay, just about uh, one of the aspects of the question that you asked originally that was about advocacy and, and how people might advocate. And then I'd love to hear Reagan and Heather's thoughts on that as, as well, because I think that's a really good question. Is that okay? Please, yes. So I think um, communicate with your legislators um, is something that we can all do. I'm sure that individuals on this call come from many different uh, walks of life. Some of your researchers, some advocates, some interested individuals from the public, letting our lawmakers know how we feel. Again, more than two, two thirds of Americans really support access uh, to uh, abortion care in America. We need to let our policymakers know that. Um, supporting individuals who are uh, seeking abortion services or post-abortion care services, um, is really important being part of that supportive network, supporting abortion funds, providing them with the resources to support the individuals who may need these care services. Abortion funds are going to be hard hit because the needs um, are going up tremendously and they have been really the backbone of providing um, the support to individuals uh, who need them. Uh, and then um, really uh, doing the hard work of knowing what, what the evidence is and being careful about the information you're receiving uh, and not uh, transmitting misinformation inadvertently, I think is critically important. Um, we are in an era uh, that is ripe with misinformation. And the way that we can counter that is by making sure we are well-educated um, and that we are passing um, high quality information on to others uh, so that they can make uh, good decisions. Alitha, I just want to pick up on your reference to abortion funds. Not everybody may know what they are and why they exist. Perhaps you or uh, two of our other panel, any of the other two panelists might want to speak to that just so that the that um, part of the infrastructure is understood. Sure. And I'm I'm happy to um, to take uh, to explain that. So abortion funds uh, are uh, entities. Uh, that fundraise in order to have uh, resources available, be they financial or staff or providing counts counseling and other support to support individuals who need to access uh, abortion services, um, but may not have all the means. Um, so they can help with defraying the costs of services. They can help with provide with um, the cost of travel, if that's necessary, hotel stays. They can help with connecting people with um, uh, others who can help uh, with that, travel specialists, social workers, whatever those resources are that individuals might need in order to access the, the care and services um, that are important to them. And that includes um, uh, connecting them up uh, with other support um, services um, to help even after uh, the delivery, uh, after the services are delivered, getting them connected back up with, um, with care providers. Um, so really stepping in and providing that support to individuals um, who may need abortion care services, but don't have the resources um, to access them. Right. Yep. And just to, to um, point folks in, in a direction, uh, they can Google or look at uh, the na National Network of Abortion Funds to sort of look at giving nationally or identify abortion funds in their own state. I think it's all, you know, we've, we've spoken a lot today about the impacts for individuals, families, communities, um, access to reproductive health services writ large. And we've talked a little bit about impacts for providers and the very ambiguous and complicated um, place that they're operating in. We haven't talked as much about abortion funds and practical support organizations. So thank you for lifting this up, Aletha. And I think it's important to remember that because of the way that some of these laws were written and the nefarious use of aiding and abetting um, clauses, many of these places, particularly in Texas and other states where that have these clauses, have stopped operating because they are concerned about criminal um, charges against them. And so not only do we now have a situation where abortion provision has gone completely dark or almost dark in these states. Also the people who are generally funding and supporting and helping these people connect to care and services are also no longer operating. 
tactic, um, adding insult to injury. So there's huge need there. So, so in terms of short term, focusing on just whatever we can do at the community level to connect people to care and services for abortion care 100%. And also reducing system barriers to access to contraception. Those are immediate needs across the country. Um, and that's all work that we can be doing in our own communities, in our own hospital systems, in our own pharmacies, wherever we have influence, right? Um, longer term, I think the only way we get through this and past this is true culture change to combat stigma for abortion, right? We have allowed abortion to be marginalized in our institutions. We have avoided talking about it. It has not been people's primary political concern for, for many of us, right? Um, and now that has allowed us to get to this place. And, and I think the only silver lining I see in this is that we're having more conversations about this vis-a-vis -vis today. Um, we're talking about it more in social media. Kansas, you know, unexpected win. I think it shows that 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 people are willing to sort of take a stand on this, but it's not the only issue that people care about. And if someone has to sort of weigh voting on the economy or voting on abortion, that's going to be really challenging. So I think we really need to just undo and address abortion stigma writ large across our systems um, in our hearts uh, to get to a better place on this long term. And I would I would second everything that, that Reagan and Malvitha already laid out to add to that list. Um, as a lawyer, <laughs> I will add that um, I think long term, I would really love to see um, a right to reproductive freedom and equality. Um, and, <laughs> you know, we've seen different efforts at the state level and varying degrees of that at the, at the federal level. But it, it's really important. And, you know, I think it, relatedly, as in terms of what you can do personally, pay attention to how the Dobbs decision is impacting those other rights and, and the other facets of life, because the, the majority opinion lays out a roadmap for eviscerating other important rights. You know, on its own, getting rid of abortion access is bad enough. This decision even um, has implications for the right to contraception, same-sex marriage, um, the Roe decision did a lot more than just establish the right to abortion. It also solidified and expanded the right to privacy and liberty, which is the basis for so many of our rights, the right to contraception, marriage, family relations, intimacy. So the, the implications um, for this decision are, are just so wide reaching. So I, I would urge folks to pay attention to the ways that our other rights are getting diminished. Um, and, and, and really, I, I couldn't second the destigmatizing de um, ask more because, you know, we see really stigmatizing language in, in all of the legislation, um, you know, that, that's how misinformation flourishes. And without having the hard conversations um, that will eventually become easy, um, I, I think in, in that environment, this misinformation and this legislation is just so much more easy to, for, for folks to accept. And I just wanted to pick up on the um, advocating to our legislators, as Aletha brought up, there's a lot in the chat about professional organizations. I think, you know, wherever your sphere of comfort is, but there are many, especially for people who are in medicine or re related healthcare fields, which is a lot of what the Q&A is about, um, many major national medical membership organizations have spoken out quite vociferously about um, the dangers of lack of protection for abortion access for, um, for the public health. So thanking them for that, reminding them to stay active in this. Um, we, those organizations are often have an advocacy arm that interfaces directly with our policymakers. So knowing that their membership is supporting their work in this area, I think is also really helpful and important. Um, Regan, maybe you could speak a little bit um, in terms of power to decide and sort of how your, you think your messaging is important to the actual people you're serving as an organization. Thank you for that question. 
Um, you know, for for a long time now, sort of our, our mission is has been to increase access to reputable, evidence informed um, sexual and reproductive health information in a way that resonates with young people. And it's not often sort of the doctor speak that we use or the very clinical or um, very legalized terms, but in really accessible terms to to folks who need um, and are seeking this information. Uh, so we're really proud to do that on our website, Bedsider, which is focused on contraception access. So we have a contraceptive access fund there. And now through our website, abortionfinder.org, uh, where people are able to access information about where they can get care and what the support mechanisms are around that, where they can get funding and have access to practical support. Um, and we are finding that more and more people are accessing that website from highly restricted states. Um, the highest percentage coming from Texas right now. So it is the folks most in need who are relying on our resources, which is which is great. Um, but there is also a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there, right? As there has been around the COVID pandemic, it's also true around abortion access and contraception. And so I think another ask is for social media companies and for search engines to do a better job about elucidating where there is misinformation and removing it or flagging it wherever possible. I think it's it's more critical now than ever than ever to make sure that people have access to evidence based information at their um, fingertips. Um, there's been a, a lot of research done, in fact, some of it by the Guttmacher Institute about crisis pregnancy centers. Um, which are very ubiquitous across the country. These are physical locations that often look like clinics, but do not provide comprehensive reproductive health services and often um, dupe people into ultrasounds and, and give them misinformation about their own bodies and how far along they are in pregnancy in order to trick them to continue their pregnancies or to not have abortion care. These things are being duplicated in online settings with misinformation about medication, abortion medications and other services. And so it's something that we all need to be paying more attention to and ensuring that there are vetted high quality resources, both in physical brick and mortar spaces, as well as in digital spaces online. And that's a space that we're trying to occupy at Power to Decide, but there's certainly more work to be done in this area. Thank you, Reagan. We just have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to ask each of you to give the group sort of one short term to do that we as a collective could act upon um, as we think about where our power is in shaping the discourse and the future for abortion access and reproductive health. Um, Heather, I'll start with you. I hope that's okay. Sure. And um... So for short term, um, in the spirit of destigmatizing abortion, have a conversation with, with one person that you haven't talked about abortion with before. And it could, you know, a loved one, somebody that you don't know their stance on abortion. Um, I have found being in this line of work that um, people tell me their abortion stories all the time. Like you never know what, what's, up, what's in somebody's heart and what their, their lived experience is and, and until you ask. Um, and, and long-term, I would encourage both policymakers and, and all of us when we're having conversations with policymakers or with our friends and family is to think about, you know, one, ensuring access to abortion care and reproductive health care. But second, that when we are talking about abortion care and other reproductive health care, that we are thinking of also about the types of policies that can either support or detract from a parent's ability to live a full and healthy life. Um, you know, I think that the folks on the other side claim to support families um, and pregnant people and, and children. And I would love to see us really, really own that space. Um, what are the policies that we can do, uh, can, can forward to support a full and healthy life for, for children, for people who are ready to become parents or want to become parents? Um, look, at, look at the people um, holistically. What kind of life do we want people to be able to live? What kind of life do we want people to be able to have for their families and push and support those policies? Thank you, Heather. Aletha. What I would recommend is that each of you encourage someone to go into an area uh, where they can be a provider uh, for individuals who need uh, abortion or post-abortion care services. Um, there are a number of questions that came up in the chat about what is happening with training and workforce development. We did have an opportunity to touch on that here today. 
Um, but the reality is that the number of abortion providers in this country has declined by almost half since 1982. And I know that there are a lot of concerns uh, among trainees who are interested in careers in OBGYN, family medicine, um, other primary care specialties that provide these kinds of care services um, or do counseling or referrals. The legislative landscape that we're looking at is not a reason for us to have our workforce dry up. Encourage people to become nurses, school nurses. There were a number of questions that came up, OBGYNs, social workers, uh, and others across the spectrum of providers, because that is how we make sure that these services are still available and are still high quality. Thank you. And given my comments around, I, I feel like uh, combating stigma is the only way through this. I'm going to sort of uh, double click on that and, and reiterate what Heather said. I think we need to be talking about this more and doing the work internally. Uh, I've been an abortion provider now since I was a medical student there at the University of Pennsylvania 20 years ago. And I can tell you that I feel very differently about this issue today than I did then. Um, and so it's really incumbent upon all of us to continue to interrogate our values on this and to talk to people about it, post on social media about it. And if you're not comfortable, that doesn't mean necessarily posting like abortion care on demand for everyone, no matter what, but to say everyone deserves the power and the opportunity to make important decisions about their bodily autonomy and what their family looks like, right? We can all sort of galvanize around those values. Um, and ensure that that is something that as a nation, we make available to everyone, no matter what state they live in, what color they happen to be, or what their income is. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Really appreciate this panel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, LDI. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's such a, an important conversation and I'm really thankful that you all took the time today to join us for that conversation. Um, and I hope that we can continue to have this conversation um, to hear about the importance of evidence and how, how that can um, inform health policy around this critical issue and about abortion is really a critical piece of health care. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.